You're listening to Hey guys, this is Scott, and welcome back to the podcast. I hope you and your families are all doing well. It seems like we're about to come out of this, the lockdown. So I'm super happy to be, you know, to feel at least some semblance of normalcy returning. I decided to make some changes to my sculpture I was working on over the last couple podcast episodes. It was the sculpture I was working on in the time lapse. So I'm changing Hatchet Bear. I'm going to approach it again in the future. I don't know exactly when, but I'll be doing that again and just try to do it better. I've got like a big painting by Justin Sweet in my house of a, it's like my favorite, one of my favorite themes that Justin does, which are like these writers, like my son calls them warrior mans with a Z. Warrior mans. Let's draw warrior mans, daddy. And uh, it's a warrior man on a, on a big reptile like a barbarian ranger kind of dude on a dragon creature. And my son sees that, and I've done some sculptures like that, like small maquettes. So he saw my hatchet bear, and then he took an action figure. He took K2SO from Star Wars, put a bunch of clay on him, like giant arms and a crazy head crest and tubes and stuff, like he was kit bashing, basically, like he had seen me do. And then he put... K2SO on top of the hatchet bear, and he's like, look, daddy, he's a, he's a warrior man. It's like, isn't that cool? And I was like, damn, that is cool. Like, it looked way better. It looked way cooler than what I had done. And just as far as the shapes, it looked more interesting and slightly surreal and fun. So I went with that. I decided I'd be a fun exercise as well to just, like, go with it. And also to build up my son's confidence, like, take his idea, you know, just do it. Just take his idea, tell him it's a good idea, and make the most of it. See if you can make it dope. Okay, let's get to it. I've got three questions for this episode. The first one is from Alec. Who were your art mentors? Definitely have had art mentors, and who were they? I'd say there's like two, there's a couple categories here. This is important. There are people who have like actually directly been mentors that have spent time with in one-on-one fashion or extended periods of time that have invested in me, have real relationships with. And then there were mentors that have been more uh, peripheral, you know, or like there's been more of a, um, like a mentor from afar. And then there have been artists, people that I've had like Uh, creative symbiotic relationships with there's been a handful of people like that that have really been an important part of my creative uh, my like development and so we'll go through those three I guess we'll start with uh, let's start with the peripheral ones there's a couple that are really important but I don't know if I could like uh, really genuinely say that they've been my mentors because we've had like a very limited number of interactions and, you know, that's we didn't actually, it's not like we were hanging out and stuff. And I think those two, I think there's two. Yeah, I think there's two. And those two would be Marshall Vandruff, you know, Marshall on the um, Draftsman podcast. Um, really great teacher. He does have an amazing radio voice. It's funny. They, they did a Proco challenge with Vance Kovacs a while ago, and they mentioned something like that in the uh, video stand did. Marshall does have a really good voice for narration. That was funny. So yeah, Marshall has been a a kind of mentor, and Simon Lee. Both of those guys have been. They, I'd say, those are my two like mentors from afar, you know, or or maybe they've, uh, maybe it's that they've had more impact on me than either of them would know. Marshall through just like a handful of conversations, when I was young and like very impressionable and needed. I like needed something, you know, needed a nudge. Like I needed someone to acknowledge me. And there were a couple key things he told me that played a significant role in my development. And also just observing his passion, like for teaching, 
and his knowledge. He just was a neat guy. Like there's a there's a couple things that interesting stories that happened with Marshall. One, I was I was a big fan of Justin Sweet and Vance Kovacs and was basically trying to I've mentioned this before, was aping their art, trying to figure out how to I don't know, be a clone, I guess. Like trying to be their third their third wheel apprentice or something. And uh, I would go to Marshall's workshops and talk to him. I was thinking maybe Marshall will teach me how to do that. Like a lot of young kids do. They don't really know what they're doing. They're just like, maybe, maybe they need validation. They need encouragement. They need help. And they don't, they don't know what to do. So they just go around showing their work to people, hoping that lightning will strike, like magic will happen. And some, I don't know, I could help, someone will give them an opportunity or something. I'm not sure what I was hoping for, but I was doing that and was going to Marshall's workshops and then ask him if I, you know, if he'd take a look at my stuff later. He was busy going somewhere, probably go have his own life, be with his kid or something, you know, like go like get away from all the teenagers bugging him. And I like met him like so we like were I was like meeting him after class and basically like walking with him back to his car at like a small window of time. He gave me where I could walk back with him and chat with him. And we were like in the elevator. Like what a stalker, you know, like talking to a guy in the elevator <laughs> that I was. <laughs> and um, I was, he said something like, you're, you're a fan of Justin and Vance's, right? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, and you want to create art like them, right? And I was like, yeah, I mean, that'd be cool. Like kind of sheepish. And he's like, well, you're doing it. And that was a super generous thing. He said something like that. Like it, it was a very generous thing to say because it wasn't entirely accurate. It, it both made me feel good. And it just shows what a good teacher he is. He's like, built, he built me up. Made me feel good about myself. But then it kind of, there was a follow-up. It was like, but you don't want to do that. Like You don't want to be that. Because you're never going to actually be them. You're only ever going to be like a knockoff of them. And that was the actual truth. It's like, it, I was doing it. Like I was actually trying to be like them. I was not actually succeeding because I'm not them. And there was something important about that. And it made me feel slightly embarrassed uh, because it's like I hadn't been self, I wasn't self-aware enough. Didn't even realize that, you know, just kind of in this single-minded pursuit of, you know, this thing that I admired and uh, like an ideal that I was after. But it was like having the wool, like the curtain pulled back and being like, oh, oh, snap. You're like, this, you know, this is kind of like, childish like it's not childish it's like it's time for a change like this is not the this is not the thing you should be doing or at least not anymore and uh but that was important and he just suggested i go i wanted like that i that i go take in some new take in some new influences like like bring in some new ideas like new new reference points new stimuli and that went, that kicked me off this like whole big long road of self-discovery that was really good for me. Really cool. Had a big impact on me, had a big impact on the way I approach teaching and the development of like voice with, with artists that I work with and with students. And, uh, and a lot of that can be credited to Marshall basically caused some light bulbs to switch on. That's the kind of guy he is. Also, he inspired me with teaching because I saw him as a kind of modern day I see him as a kind of modern day Howard Pyle, like bringing this like intense love and passion of art to the world and uh, just having a really good influence on our, you know, like culture of creativity and artists and just a good influence on a whole generation of young people. There's like a lot of artists he's had like, amazing artists he's had a good impact on that have gone out into the world and are doing cool things. And I like that idea. I think that's like a good, as far as teaching goes, that's a good ideal to strive for, to be that kind of person. And then also uh, Simon Lee is the other influence. So I've taken a couple classes with Simon and same kind of deal. You know, he's just offering his workshops. I pay him money. I get to go there and interact with him. But that was it, really. You know, we just had like a handful of interactions. But but he's always, the guy is a genius and always really just really i don't know he's just a good guy man he's like you know he's in his probably mid 40s now or something and 
there's a couple key key stories he shares with his students that he shared with us that made a big impression on me. And, and he didn't, from what I remember, he didn't become a really transitioned to professional sculptor, make the kind of like, you know, conscious, like, I'm going to do this move, business move, until he was like 40 years old. He'd been a web developer, I think, something like that, website designer. And sculpting was like his hobby in the side, in the background. He was like becoming great in the background. It was something he loved to do, but he wasn't like necessarily sharing it or monetizing it yet. And part, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons that's cool. One is that it totally, it just totally negates the idea that, of like being the young prodigy, that you need to be a young prodigy. Just fuck that, man. For one thing, it's that's encouraging to me because I'm not young anymore. I'm 34. I'm not, you know, I'm a young man, but I'm not like young, young. I'm 35 now. And so that's part of my life is gone. And if I, you know, if I was under the impression, if I believed that you have to be a young prodigy in order to be successful, then my, you know, I'd be, I'd have a, a very, that'd be a difficult like belief to to reconcile like with my with my life it'd be difficult to go forward you know and thinking that there's still a kind of like a reason to create if i thought that like my i'd already missed my window <laughs> you know to do great work i don't know that that, that was really awesome to me just it just i when i was young i told myself when i was like 20 when i was like 22 i thought that when I was 25, I was going to be a millionaire. I was going to be buff. <laughs> and I was going to publish my first children's book. Those were like my goals. I was going to be buff. What a dumb goal. Or not dumb, but just it just shows where my head was at. Buff, million dollars in a, in a children's book. I was going to be like a buff Chris Van Allsburg or something. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but that stuff didn't happen. You know, I got kind of buff, but that was about it. My art still sucked and I was... And I was in debt from going to college. <laughs> Most people I interact with through the mentorships and students, there's a kind of like, I'm not there yet. I'm behind. They're comparing themselves to their peers. Like there's a, you know, a lot of like negative self-belief about, about being behind, about like not being able to catch up. You're never going to be able to do it. Like always, it's always this kind of talk. And Simon, to me, was just like a living embodiment of how bogus all that is. Is you know, he's forty years old. He'd been leveling up in the shadows, you know, gaining his confidence, developing his voice, and then he rubbed it onto the scene. You know, he became the artist he's meant to become. He allowed himself, you know, time to become that artist, and and then shared himself with the world. And there's something really beautiful about that. And patient. You know, which is wonderful. It's like there's also a kind of like maturity there that came along with that, that you see in him as like a teacher and as an artist. His like outlook on creativity, creative endeavor, the way he interacts with students, the people he comes into contact with. It's a it, another person is a very good influence on our community. It's not like, oh, look at my magic trick, look how cool I am. You'll never be like me. You know, it's uh, less like look how cool I am. It's just a, a guy who's really mature, has a good head on his shoulders, like good communicator. A lot of his stories, like the, you know, I think he told me like his, he made a deal with his wife that he could have like one year to work on his, to go independent and make things happen, or he'd go back and do the web stuff. And he's, and instead he did it, you know, he succeeded. He kicked, and he kicked ass. And now he's the guy we all know and whose work we love. And there's something awesome and inspiring about that for, for me because I was like working in games and not that satisfied in the, in the role I currently was doing in games. I basically decided to make the same kind of leap of faith in my life. And uh, Simon, you know, kind of indirectly had a big impact on that, not to like put that responsibility on his shoulders for my fate. <laughs> But so those are the two that have had a kind of indirect, direct and indirect influence on me. Very big influence, though somewhat 
like you know at a distance and if you ever get a chance to study with either of them your life will be better for it is there and they're also good good men like good people they treat people well their head they're not full of bullshit bogus ideas and uh, and they will help you so yeah simon and marshall are cool okay so the next mentors like the more like direct I oh, know I'll do that. I'll save that one last. That's sort of like the, I guess, the most fun. Next would be, I think this is important. Like a lot of times there's just only talk about mentors, mentors, mentors. But, you know, most of us, we have a handful of mentors, but they're also basically friends, like people you have in your life who are like peers that they become almost like um, creative, like at least in the art world, they're like creative companions. They're like your sounding board you know your main creative like homie or collaborators that you can really share your work with in a genuine open way and get real feedback on uh you know like on your work and in some ways they're more important than mentors because you have someone to interact with in a more day-to-day -day, someone who's more available to you there's like a really along for the ride and i've had a couple of people like that in my life the main ones would be like my friend James Nuanez. I don't even know if he won his name on here. Crap. James, my, my friend James, and uh, who's a brilliant, brilliant artist. Brilliant, you know, like, I, I guess you'd call him a cartoonist and web developer. Just a super smart guy, really deep feeling, introspective person. And uh, I just love that guy. Probably one of the best friends of my life. I've been friends with him for more than a decade and uh things never change like our ability to communicate and connect just never changes and he's the best i was trying to do paintings i remember a couple times like one where you, i was using really bright colors like almost pure pigment from the tube some painting of space pirates that was really bad I had no perspective just a bad painting and he was making fun of he's like dude you can't just use the pigment straight out of the tube and I remember being like, oh, it's kind of not like, but like, he's probably right. But then also kind of like, why not? And it's just ironic because now a lot of this graphic stuff I'm doing, I'm using like really ridiculous bright colors. And it's totally like that was a kind of a, a part of my general sensibilities that I just didn't know how to employ properly yet. And uh, it's just ironic to me. He's like, dude, your colors are too bright. And I'm like, well, they're still bright. <laughs> And also, I remember him telling me, like, one time, I had, like, I always have a bunch of ideas, and I did then, and I was always writing them down and getting excited. But I remember him saying, Scott, you have so many ideas, but you never do any of them. And I was like, that's not true. I have 10 ideas, and, you know, in a month, and maybe I do two of them, you know, but that's still two things I actually got done. I've got, like, a surplus of ideas. But at least I'm actually doing things and actually making, you know, small inroads towards the progression of my career. And that was an important interaction, actually, because I remember I had to kind of like stick up for myself a bit because it's it's it was actually not accurate that I wasn't doing things. I was doing a lot. It's just that it was so much enthusiasm and passion. It was a kind of a, an overload. And that was also a lesson as well as I needed to be a little more self-aware conscious of how my own enthusiasm could actually potentially like um, i don't know like affect other people you just got to be sensitive or thoughtful when you're interacting with other people don't just like offload all your verbal passion diarrhea onto other people like look what i'm doing look what look at me look at me look at me it's kind of self-centered and you got to be careful with that and also and i had like a comic we would get together and talk about comics we were both working on comics he was really he actually really did some comics that are really great. And uh, he's made changes in his life doing other things, but he's like a brilliant comic artist. And he actually did the comics. I was always talking about making these like really epic, like graphic novels that were way above my like skill level. And I just did not have the skills to be able to pull off, but I would just have these like dreams of doing these epic graphic novels. And I remember telling him about one, this like really wild space opera kind of thing. It's really over the top and melodramatic and violent and stuff. And just really a reflection of where my head was at when I was like 20, you know, 24 or something. 
I remember him saying something like, like me spouting off my like finale of the story and then kind of waiting, like we're walking and thinking like, you know, like, wasn't that cool? And him looking at me and being like, that's pretty crazy, man. <laughs> like, like that, like that was it. Like, that's pretty crazy, man. And me just kind of inside feeling deflated and also laughing. And I remember it to this day and a wonder, like, I love it, that memory. And it's going to end up making its way into a story if I ever create one because there's something so fun about it was more about this person who was kind of like being sweet and supportive and indulging his friend i don't know there's <laughs> something awesome about about that that statement he made where he's like looking at his friend who's kind of like clueless and hyper creative and passionate and but amateur and then still being encouraging as much as he could be there's i don't know i don't know how to describe it but there's something awesome about it that's James. He's always been by my side, always encouraging me, always good to me, always a fellow like conspirator and creativity, like coming up with ideas and just like one of my best friends. So him and uh, my buddy Mike Brainerd. Mike Brainerd is the lead artist over at Turtle Rock right now. And we lit, we were roommates for years, collaborators on all kinds of ideas and projects and still are, you know, very much of like mind and have projects to fulfill together in the future. But what, you know, one of my greatest clubbers, cause I got to, you know, we live together. So I'm like with them every day and we're like talking about things and brainstorming and like, you know, living out the, you know, the, the, uh, the birth of the ideas together. And that's an amazing thing to have someone who can like come in your room and be like, can you take a look at this, you know, and, and vice versa, or, you know, you can go sit in the hot tub and just dream, you know, about art and ideas and. There's something kind of awesome about it that I hope, you know, if you're a young artist, I hope you get a chance to live with some other artists that you trust who are good people. And because uh, it's a wonderful experience. And then, you know, I've got this like crew of young guys working for me now, this Tarpit Studios crew. And uh, they're kind of like that too, you know. It's a, it's a younger um, endeavor. Like it's, we haven't been doing it that long, you know, but but they do act as a kind of, sounding board for my creativity but as far as like my my old you know my old school blood brother creative creative blood brother homies it's james and mike oh shit and definitely i would have to, yeah i would say silvano my buddy silvano matthews painting caves he's the guy who does all the audio for these things i just didn't think of him immediately because he's a musician i just think i was thinking only in regards to art but silvano's like a massive like inspiration and collaborator and we really gel in a deep way too it's just somewhat different because the you know like the the um vocabulary is somewhat different and stuff and you know i don't actually know anything about music not really but we really connect and encourage each other and so yeah he'd be more yeah like a it's less of a mentor but more just more of a a collaborator like an important collaborator in my life so now for the actual, like, who are the like direct mentors? So I mentioned Simon and Marshall, mentioned my collaborators, James, Mike, and Silvano, my Torpid Studios crew, and uh, but now like my actual direct mentors. These are the people you know that are almost all older than me. Um, you know they've had more like uh, just actually more years to their name, more experience of life who have shared insights like skills, wisdom, compassion, you know, some money, you know, like I've actually given me jobs. Uh, these are, these are my real mentors. Let's go through it. I'm just going to, I am going to kind of try to limit it to art. Okay. My, but my first art mentor would be Mele Peltz. Mrs. Peltz, my art teacher in high school. You know, it's important not to forget the good people in your past life. Mrs. Peltz, she's the one that really, first person, truly the first person who really seriously encouraged my sculpting. Like, really encouraged it. She, uh, she let me, there was like a, a storage room, a back storage room in the, like, art department part of the campus at our high school. And I was such a weird introvert. She would let me just go back in there alone 
The rest of the class is meeting in the regular classroom. But you would let me just go hide back in the storage room by myself and sculpt and listen to music alone in the AP art class. I took AP art like three or four times in high school and never took the AP exam because I didn't give a shit about that stuff. I just wanted to sculpt monsters and have freedom. And uh, she totally supported me in it. And she would help me like learn about materials. I think she, I think she might have been the one to first introduce me to Sculpey or buy me my first Sculpey. I can't remember fully. But it was about that time I met the Schiffler brothers too. And I uh, did a bunch of sculptures in her class. Like a couple of them got shown in like little award shows in town. And she also got me to sign up. She brought me the sign up for this like sculpture special effects class that was taught by some sculptors from Garner Holt Productions in San Bernardino. They were like a special effects, like a production studio, practical effects studio. They they worked on like the Nightmare Before Christmas right at Disneyland and they would sculpt like big full-size fabrications of dinosaurs for museums and things like that. They did all kinds of stuff. And they taught a workshop at a local comic store where we like just were sculpting in wet clay and stuff like that. And I took that workshop and I was, I was just like in heaven and I was offered a internship at the end of it, at the end of the, of the workshop, because they liked my, they liked me and they liked my stuff. And, and yeah, I got offered an internship and I didn't take it like a fucking dummy. I didn't take it because my, Parents said I needed to make money and the internship was not paid. And I was honestly kind of scared. I was like too scared to take it. That's like, I don't really have a lot of art regrets, but that's like one, the one art regret. So I think that would have been cool to do. Not a full regret because I became a lifeguard and that sent me off on a bunch of amazing adventures. Got into water polo and swimming and became a lifeguard. Lived on Catalina Island and got to go spear fishing and kayaking and you know, have amazing experiences there. But it would have been cool to work at a special effects studio in high school. Anyhow, but Melly Peltz was really responsible for a lot of that, like the pursuit of sculpture as a passion. She would fire my, my, my clay, my water-based clay sculpts for me and take good care of them. And she, she's just a sweetheart of a lady. She like, I like loved her actually. Like, like she was like my art mom. And I forget about her sometimes because, you know, it's just as you get older and you remember the mentors maybe at the more critical stages of your life. But Mrs. Peltz laid a foundation for my love of creativity. She nurtured it. She was like, just nurtured my creative spirit. She wasn't like trying to discipline me, like do this, do it this way. Like your anatomy's off, whatever, like, you know, bullshit. She just let me grow. And fall in love with my craft. And I think that love is the like foundation of everything I do. I think that love is more important than anything. Because it will sustain you in during the times when you are forced to level up. You know, or like address a weak, a weak point in your skill set. Or, you know, if you're, if you're like depressed or you've lost your mojo. It's that love that will bring you back. Because you just can't, can't you're like compelled to create. Because it's part of who you are. Miss Peltz was my first mentor. Then I go to college. Damn, I had mentors there too. Go to college. Robin Richardson. She's the head of the illustration department at Cal State Long Beach. She was a kind of mentor. Slightly less directly, you know, because they just have a bunch of students in the class. And I was just this dumb young boy trying to draw crazy monsters fighting all the time. And she probably wasn't very interested in that. But she gave me good feedback. All the, all the kind of like gestural stuff I do with Lasso Tool is based... What Everything I do with Lasso Tool is basically just gesture drawings. It's like a, a pencil converted into a, a gesture. A pencil line converted into a Lasso Tool. And that all comes from Robin, from her costume figure drawing classes. She was... she's. Well, I remember her being kind of like a firm believer in the importance of gesture drawing in regards to... And as far as it would help you develop voice. 
and we just did a, a shit ton of it. And that whole art department over there, it's I'd say it, they used to have, when I went to school there, they hadn't quite caught up. Like they weren't really offering stuff that was useful to the entertainment industry outside of like storyboarding, basically. Like they couldn't help me in being a concept artist, not really. I had to learn a bunch of that stuff afterwards. But I don't really mean that as a like, like that's, that wasn't really what they did. You know, that wasn't like their area of expertise. So you couldn't really, I don't know. They're good, they're good people and they're good influences on me. Uh, but they weren't painting sci-fi monster stuff. That wasn't their thing. So they couldn't really teach me that very well. Anyhow, um, but Robin was a really good teacher. Had a bit, big impact on the way, like I think about drawing, the importance of gesture drawing. And I carry all that stuff through into my own teaching of my, my, my students and in my own work. Like a good silhouette is really just a glorified gesture drawing. So, you know, if you want to do good shit with shape, you just need to be drawing a ton, like a gesture drawing. Rick Reese was a kind of a mentor, a little more directly. Uh, he was like a, a, both a teacher and a grad student at Cal State Long Beach when I was there, who was really encouraging. And in his class, I mentioned him in the first podcast, he's the one who introduced me to, to both Mike Mignola and Justin Sweet in one semester in his intro to digital art class. And, you know, those guys had a big influence on me. And he was just, he was just cool. He's like a cool older guy, even killed, mature, passionate about art and creativity. You know, he's just a fucking cool guy. A bit of like a rebel in the um, faculty. I liked him. And uh, Mark Michelin over there too. He, he also a storyboard artist and uh, like editorial cartoonist. He also really encouraged gesture drawing, much in the same way as Robin. They're really like they really saw eye to eye on that stuff. I think a lot of the same ideas, and he exposed me to like uh, Franz Klein, like Franz Klein's work. Like the I think it's he's an abstract expressionist. Like that shit blew my mind. Was really cool, and I thought if I could do like fantasy art, like Franz Klein, whatever that meant. But if I could figure out a way to like paint. Things that were a little more representational, with the kind of intensity, stark contrast of Franz Klein, that would be amazing. I tried to do that for a while. I couldn't, couldn't really figure it out. And uh, George Zebot, George Zebot was a teacher over there. I really opened my eyes to color. He, he like, George, was the first teacher I had that. His skill was so great that he could show me something in the moment that caused the light bulb to turn on. Lots of teachers, like, they were cool little insights and things. But I took a class with George on color, like color theory, where basically I was able to, like, he taught me the vocabulary of color, like hue. So I got a <laughs> hue, saturation, and value. You know, where I'd be like, where you could look out at the world, and you could then use that vocabulary to like define the phenomenon you were observing or define the uh, sort of like to attribute values to the colors you observe and then begin to attempt to navigate those colors or use colors. That was a really big deal to me to be able to look at something and be like, well, that's cooler relative to that. That is, you know, dark. That is uh, like more saturated it's like a more saturated green relative to that green. Like that's useful stuff because that helps you when, when you're trying to mix color. When you're color mixing, you need to be able to have that vocabulary to be able to take the steps. It's actually, it's not just naming. It's naming that helps you make choices. And I'm probably not articulating it that well right now. But that was a, that was a big deal to me. George kind of opened my eyes. And he was also fucking cool. I think he'd served in Vietnam. He was like just like really chill, like a surfer, very wise, you know, no nonsense, but also compassionate. He was a he was a very good person, and really kind to me, and um, he invested in me in different ways. I got to go to Cambodia on an amazing trip with students from Cal State Long Beach. I was kind of immature and stuff. I don't think I I think I could have gotten more out of all that than I did because I wasn't quite ready. It was almost like a mentor that was ready to mentor, 
was ready for me, but I wasn't quite ready to be mentored. I was too immature, basically. I wasn't like ready for that teacher yet, I think. Yeah, I'd say those are my main mentors at Cal State Long Beach. They were all in the illustration department. There were other good teachers I had, but not mentors. Then left Cal State Long Beach. Next real mentors would be when I got to Turtle Rock. I had a lot of adventures in between different jobs, trying to figure out my career. That's like when I met Marshall after college. Like I mentioned, like Cal State Long Beach is a really good school. And I, you know, I haven't even seen what the program's up to, but you know, I wanted to do like book fantasy book illustration and paint dragons and monsters. And there was no one really there could show me how to paint really like that and do no one who had the time or bandwidth. And so I got out of school and I was not prepared and I had to like go home, live at home for two years and work other jobs. I was a ranger and I had a lot of cool experiences, but there's like this big kind of period of time where I was sort of like floating, like in limbo, not quite good enough to be of any use to anyone, but well committed to the path. So went back, lived at home for a couple of years. I ended up getting a job at Turtle Rock in Orange County. And that's where I met some of my first, I felt like really adult working mentors because I was still pretty immature when I was in college. I was still immature when I started working at Turtle Rock, but less mature because now I was transitioning into becoming a professional. And over there it was Phil Robb, who's, I think he's the chief operating officer or, or chief creative officer. He, he's definitely like the, one, you know, one of the, he's like definitely the head creative guy. Like he's ultimately accountable for the, like, you know, the most like creative vision at Turtle Rock. I'd say he's like the art director and, or was the art director. Now it's in a little bit of operating in a different capacity, but he's like the one who actually hired me. Like I had an interview and afterwards went outside and he's like, so, you know, we, we like you. And he, I remember he asked me like, what would you, you know, what are you thinking for pay? And I was like, 50 question mark. Is that okay? Like that, you know? And he like laughed and slapped, you know, pat me on the shoulder. He's like, yeah, man, we could do that. It was like so little, 50 grand for a full-time gig. But for a single guy, that was a good deal, you know? That was a good, that was a good deal. Okay, so yeah, Phil was like my one of my first mentors at Turtle Rock. Like he's the guy who actually hired me. You know, that's a big deal. Like your first, the guy who first gives you a chance, you know? That's a big deal. He took a chance on this young, unproven kid. We just liked, wanted to give a shot. That's a fucking, you like owe that person for the rest of your life in a way. Because if he hadn't given me that gig, I wouldn't have worked on Evolve. Couldn't have, you know, all everything since has been a result of his choice to take a chance on me. And uh, so I'm like, I'll always be grateful to that. So Phil Robb was one of my mentors. And uh, I don't know, more, it's not, it's not like a, necessarily like it wasn't like teaching me stuff but you just you just learn a lot you just observe a lot of behaviors you observe someone navigating the leadership role you see them you both learn from their successes and their failures um he was very i think he he was like a kind of a fiercely independent person that was cool to watch especially in retrospect having worked in a very corporate environment like riot then Thinking back to the way Phil led, it was, it's just interesting to, I learned a lot from that. And um, I have fond memories of that kind of mode of leadership. It's a little more relaxed, a little more authentic, felt more natural and uh, less, a little less bullshit, you know, um, that I liked. And he's cool, you know, talk about guns and shoot guns together <laughs> and art and westerns and mountain man movies and you know basically like work together to make a lot of cool things happen on evolve and that was a lot of fun i got to be in a, in a way a kind of i feel pretty comfortable saying i operated in that kind of like junior art director capacity you know and uh, on evolve i was incredibly passionate and just poured in a ton of time into developing the like into that world and uh, all just all around all over the place was all over the place on that on that project like doing all kinds of things and 
not to take credit away from anyone else, but I do feel like I just, you know, I poured a lot into that. And, yeah, and Phil was responsible for that. He, like, gave me those opportunities, like, allowed me to get in there and get my hands dirty and try things and learn things. And so it was Phil, and, and from him it was mostly about, like, the chance, the, the chance he took on me and the support he gave me, and then watching him acting, like, watching him be a leader, like, learning from a guy, learning how to be a leader. That was a lot of what I got from him. Then TJ Frame uh, is a, was an, a, a really talented senior artist, the, the senior guy at Riot, who worked on some of the Star Wars prequels and like Command and Conquer, Red Alert, uh, like an old school guy, really broad, talented skill set. And he and I were fast friends because we geeked out about all the same stuff, like dinosaurs and like paleontology and guns and weightlifting like he and I were like workout buddies like lifting weights and um, talking about art and girls and life and uh, you know coming up with plans like projects we're going to do together and stuff and he's a he's a good guy and had a big influence on me and he's the guy who actually showed me how to use lasso tool I had never used it before he used it for like matte painting he was showing me like doing environment art and carving out mountains and then he'd like go in with like a he'd like create a selection for a, sh a mountain shape in the background, throw in a piece of a photo like photo bashing, you know, and then use like a you know like a textured paintbrush, and uh, you know like environment painting techniques. But just seeing him use the lasso tool like that, then that made a big impression on me. And I didn't start doing it right away, but that was like where I saw that. I'm like, what the hell? You can draw with the lasso tool? So that's kind of cool. And again, less like teaching me stuff. There's a handful of things, but our skill sets and our sensibilities are pretty different. So it wasn't like, you know, he wasn't, it, he was doing different kind of tasks than I was, but he was still a mentor in regards to just like art, creativity, being a cool older guy, kind of showing me the ropes, looking out for me, giving me advice, you know, helping me as much as he could when I, you know, when my when I need help with my work to improve it, because I was pretty shitty in the early days at Turtle Rock. I was a pretty bad artist, like straight up. And uh, TJ was helpful to me in trying to help help me out. But um, okay, so TJ was one of the guys, and then Justin Cherry was another artist over at Turtle Rock. Probably of all artists I met, there's a, there's a couple, but one of the maybe maybe two guys. One guy at Riot and uh, Justin at Turtle Rock. Justin had like the broadest professional skill set, like or the broadest range of skills that were at a like professional level that I've ever met. I never met someone. You, you know, there's the idea of like a jack of all trades, master of none. Well, Justin was like a jack of all trades, master of all of them. Like he could make music, he could illustrate. He could design, he could do animation, he could do VFX. He was, he's like a true genius, like a genius kind of guy. And I think his like, you know, I don't know how active he's in social media and stuff, but I think his uh, handle's Nephilomancer. He's awesome. And he's a very good influence on me and really interesting perspectives. And now I think he does like, he's like creative, doing like straight up like creative direction on a lot of their indie projects that Turtle Rock does. Like so for VR, the well that him and, and uh, Silvano worked on together. Silvano did the score, and Justin was like the vision holder on it. And that game is sick. The well is fucking sick. And um, some other one, I can't remember the name. I need to play it. The thing is, those games, they're really good, but they don't get the like marketing money. There's no like marketing funds behind them. Um, but the games are great that they've come out with. I can't remember what the other one's called. I feel bad. I'll put a link in the in our the video description for YouTube to those games. You should check them out because they're both really cool. And they all came in, almost like all of it came out of Justin's head. He had collaborators, but most of it is Justin's vision. And uh, and he was the guy. We talk a lot about creativity and like creative integrity, and and he also shared. I'd uh, never seen uh, Evangelion, and he shared. Eva's with me, and that was amazing. Like, I'd never seen the... He basically presented, like, a curated 
uh, introduction to the IP and took me through the correct like order of episodes, you know, and then ending with the film and that blew my mind. And just like a deep feeling, sensitive, beautiful person, also kind of a fucking savage in his own ways that I liked. Justin's really cool. And then also Zane Lyon. I think it's Lyon. Is that how you pronounce it? A turtle rock? But that guy was like, Zane was like, a, uh, I think he's like a, a game director or something at Nexon now. And he was like a, he's the one that, he, I, I, we needed to do some graphics on involved like icons. And he basically had like a, like a, a thought like, Scott, wouldn't it be fun? You like Mike Mignola type stuff. I had done a couple little experiments with the shape carving, but it was very crude and undeveloped, and they were really just experiments, but he liked them. And he was like, hey, would you want to do that for these icons and work with me? And, and it was amazing because I'd been texturing at the time on a texturing team, and I, I wasn't doing that great. I was doing okay, but I was like languishing. I was, I was not interested in it. Um, I wasn't really learning much. There was no one really teaching me how to do it. It was like not not fun. Zane kind of took me under his wing onto his crew in UI, and I was just concepting stuff for UI, and it was a blast. And that period of time, I got paid on the job. It was basically like R and D and style for this stuff I call shape carving now. Like I remember actually making a brush. I called my shape carver, and it was like just a hard angle brush, not a big deal. But that was like the tool I actually used. That's like when that stuff started to happen. And we were, we were, the hypothesis was like, could we make stuff that kind of felt like Mike Mignola art? That was the idea. And the, could we do it digital? And, and he was very encouraging to me and supported me. And a lot of what I'm doing with this shapey stuff is direct result of uh, work I did with him. It was where, where he was, he basically gave me an opportunity to learn how to do this stuff. And uh, it was really important for me. So Zane was a mentor. And I'd say that's probably it at Turtle Rockets. Other lots of nice people I interacted with, like cool guys. I'm probably forgetting someone. If I am, I apologize. But the people I was like, they were actually like uh, on a regular basis taking an interest in me and my development. I'd say pretty regular basis. Those are the, those are the guys. Um, and then at a certain point, I come into contact with Moby over there. We needed help. We were a very junior team, and uh, we needed help with our characters. And the owners had you know, worked with Moby, been aware of his work back when they all worked together at Valve. And so they hit him up. Uh, Moby came, in, came down and did some like a freelance contract with us to help us work on the characters. And I was very junior, just got, you know, got to shadow this guy a little bit and work with my art director and Moby together to develop our character roster. But really what I, what I was more like tasked with doing was I was kind of like guiding the designs and ideas along with my art director, like helping him out. And, you know, the art director would give like feedback and then I would do the paint overs. Like I would actually go implement the feedback on Moby's art and not to say that Moby's art needed it really. Like, that's not, that's not really what I'm saying here. I don't want to be, like, disrespectful. I'm always a badass. Um, what happened was I got to do painovers on top of a value structure that was already good. Like, I basically got to, like, if you're going to implement, because, of course, you know, there's need for feedback and changes, and I got to basically paint on top of art that was already really solid. And there's learning that occurs there because you're sampling from a value structure that's already been established. I'm not sure how to describe it properly, but if I'm describing it properly, but basically I got to absorb like through osmosis, like some of Moby's uh, like thoughts and technique because I was painting over on top of his stuff that I got to benefit from his work and like kind of learn your, uh, like vicariously, like live with his art for a while, you know, and, and like get in, get like work on it, like work on top of it. And I'm not saying that my work made it better. I really did not actually. It was more that I got to like study his work a little bit and that I benefited a lot from that. 
and also just interacting with him as a person. He was really cool. You know, like it was the first time I'd met a, a quote unquote rock star who just obviously was, he couldn't help it. He didn't think of himself as one. He didn't call himself one. He just was, he was a badass. He would dress cool. He was cool. He'd had cool experiences. He grew up in the Caribbean. He taught windsurfing. You know, he knew about all the great artists. He was, he had a great, like a deep visual memory bank and knew a lot about art history. He could paint in oil. You know, he'd worked on Team Fort art directed Team Fortress 2 and worked on Dota 2. And he was just fucking cool. And that was my first time getting to hang out with an artist. Like, he's 10 years older than me. You know, so it was like, and he took an interest in me. He liked me. We got along. And uh, that changed my life because I got to see, I worked maybe with Moby. I don't know if it was six months or what it was. But I honestly, I felt like I learned so much in such a, like, condensed period of time and then grew so much. You know, as a result of that time that I got to spend with Moby, that it made a really big impression on me, and uh, it motivated me to like want to do more of that. Basically, that's what led me to want to go to Riot. He did the thing that I was trying to do, you know. So it was like a more direct, like one-to-one, uh, beneficial relationship. Like he could show me the things I wanted to know. You know, interacting with someone like that where you learn so much so fast, it was like, it made an impression on me like f- forever after up until I went to Riot where I was like, I want to work in that kind of, I want to work around people like that. Like people with like, like excellent artists and stuff. That was, that made a big impression on me. I thought it was, was real exciting, the idea of working around someone like that, that could help me. And that was a lot of my motivation to try to get into Riot. Yeah, and then when I went to write, yeah, Moby, Moby's one of my main mentors and a very good friend. And I genuinely love him as a person. He's really done, did a lot for me. And uh, the time at Riot was very good for my career. Made a lot of good connections. Met a lot of neat people. Got to see my brain tested up against, you know, what are supposedly some of the best. And that was good for me. And that's all a credit to Moby. Yeah, and he just, you know, same thing. It's just he's a cool guy to be around. He's got a good, a great story. He's an incredibly talented person. He's got a good heart. Uh, and then at right, yeah, I met other some other people. I had my um, my lead, Mundo Sanchez. Me and him were like on the same wavelength when it came to creativity and generating ideas and stuff. Like we had a lot of the same tastes, like sensibilities. Um, it's like we spoke the same language. We're on the same frequency. So creatively, he was awesome to be around. He was like my manager. And also he was like just the best manager by far I've ever worked with. The way he led. That was actually more where the mentorship came in. As far as creativity, it was more like collaborators. Just fucking having a great time. Like jamming. You know, like, like we're like riffing, like making music. As far as mentorship, it was watching how he led, how he managed people, his leadership style. I learned a lot from that. One of the most laid back people I've ever met. And I saw just a different, I'm used, you know, in regards to leadership, I grew up with a father who's a fire captain, like a leader of men. They deal with death like every day and struggle and um, intense situations, danger and consequence. And so my interpretation of leadership has always been that it should be like that. Like shit's on the line and you got a, you know, like more military approach. And Mundo is like entirely the opposite because it's art. You know, we're not curing cancer. We're making wizards, you know. And there's a kind of reality that when it comes to creative people, (laughs) that genuine creativity usually comes. Like when people are really making cool shit. A lot of times is when they're very comfortable. They're, they're in like a, like their place, their little studio, their little nook, you know, th- their home. You have to feel like comfortable enough, like safe enough in the moment to make yourself vulnerable. Like that's when magic can happen. And uh, I've always kind of like believed that, but never necessarily like found that in a professional environment or situation. It's always like stress. And it's always 
like you see more of like a, a corporate leadership type of uh, personality or approach emerge or a philosophy emerge. And I don't think it's that conducive to genuine creativity. I think it actually squelches it. I think it's bad. That's not the way to do it. It doesn't mean you don't need discipline and structure. It just means that like leading artists is not the same thing. It's just the truth. Even if you want to think you're cool, like, you know, cool dudes, you're not fucking soldiers. You know, you're not firefighters. You're not cops. We're drawing wizards and orcs, and let's be real with ourselves about it. We're dreaming, creating things, and to lead a, a bunch of dreamers is a different thing than leading, uh, yeah, than leading a bunch of public servants. And I saw Mundo do that. I saw him like create an environment that was very conducive to creativity, and we were jamming every day. We had a particular crew. Myself, Mundo, Din Yang Ho, and Christopher Campbell that were making music for a while, and it was great. And uh, and I take I took those learnings to heart, and I'm leading my team in the same way. Mundo was the shit. Like he's seriously one of the best leaders I ever worked with. And a lot of it is to do with just being a really laid back guy, not taking himself too seriously, you know, and uh, not take not taking things personally. He's just trying to help creative people be their best. That's it. That's it. That's it. That was like my most recent active mentor. Okay, this next question, I think it's from Rick. I can't remember. Uh, okay, I really like this question, though. This is just really fun. Like, the the deep philosophical stuff, I enjoy talking about those things, but also it's, I, I want to try to mix it up with some stuff that's a little more lighthearted. This next one, I think it's from Rick, and it's, do you have any guilty pleasures? I think the question which might have been, any guilty pleasures? Question mark. And hell yeah, I do. And they're fun to talk about. They are. I've li I made a list. And this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. They would be He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, particularly Battle Cat. Like, when I was a little kid, we had a bunch of He-Man stuff, and all I really cared about was Battle Cat. Like, He-Man is just an accessory to Battle Cat, in my mind. You got a green tiger with orange stripes on him, and he gets dope armor, crimson red armor. And a warrior man gets right on him. That's what life is all about. That's, like, the coolest thing. That's my greatest power fantasy, to get to ride on a tiger. It's not about He-Man, that's me riding on Battle Cat. Anyways, so I really always really liked He-Man. I always thought it was really fun. Those were some of the first toys, action figures I interacted with as a very little boy. My brother had all of them. He's four years older than me. I was too young, but I still thought they were awesome. And we had um, Grizzlor with the real fur and that crazy robot hawk. And we had Snake Mountain and Castle Grayskull. And uh, we had Many Faces and Triclops. And we had... Tongue Lasher, we had Skeletor and Panthor, who I called the Shadow Cat, because I thought like Battle Cat, Shadow Cat, I didn't know. I can't remember. I think we might have had Man at Arms. I think we had Man at Arms. And I do remember, I do have a memory about Man at Arms. He had this really cool, like golden brass looking mace. And I thought it was so cool. I wonder if that's why I like war clubs. I thought it was so cool when I was a little kid, and we lost it one day. We went to, I think, get the car washed. And I think it got vacuumed up or fell out when my dad was cleaning the car. We lost Man-at-Arms Mace. And I, I must have been, like, younger than five. And I, I, remember, I remember it still, 35 years old. I remember being really sad we lost Man-at-Arms Mace and wanting to, like, like, I remember kind of looking for it every once in a while. For years in the old Bronco we had trying to see if maybe I could find it under a seat but it was gone like it for some reason mattered that much to me uh, anyway so Masters of the Universe I love that IP I think it's so creative and fun it's it's like an IP where you see people just like having a good time it reminds me of like that's me and my buddies on the jobs we've been on where we're just like 
having a good time and letting our imaginations run wild. And uh, it's probably my favorite IP in history. <laughs> uh, it's just fun. It doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's a good time. It's colorful. Bombastic. The guy's called He-Man for crying out loud. Okay. Also, guilty pleasure is Nutella, the food. The, well, I guess you quote unquote food, not really food. Sugar, sugar, butter, oil, gross. But it's so good. Guilty pleasure. I've probably eaten too much Nutella in my life. Not good for me. Um, <laughs> dark haired brunettes. Ooh, that's a real thing. We won't go there though. Um, martial arts. A true guilty pleasure. I still follow UFC. I was super into martial arts when I was younger. Bruce Lee and like back before, you know, people were throwing elbows in UFC. I was like studying Muay Thai and I discovered the utility of them. I was like a genuinely, I was genuinely into, into uh, innovation in martial arts. And I was, I used to train every day. I used to train every single day. And uh, that was a kind of a road I considered going down that I was just too scared to and the creativity really truly is like my my first love and you know there comes a time where you have to like decide like am i am i gonna keep doing this taking this martial arts just like fighting stuff like super seriously or am i gonna take art seriously and and it was important that i i thought it was important that i become like a more peaceful person and kind of put aside the martial arts as seriously but i still love them and my relation, my just my relationship to them has changed. More of a spectator, and it's more of a fun hobby, something to keep in shape. You know, there will be times where I'll sort of like oscillate back and forth as far as my involvement in it. And uh, I love the martial arts; I think they're cool. I think I think when I was younger, I didn't have enough guidance. I didn't have like a teacher, so I was just a dangerous young person with dangerous skills. But I didn't have someone. I didn't ever had like an official like teacher in martial arts. I took a lot of classes and would train and stuff, but I never had someone to like smack me upside the head and be like, what the fuck you think you're doing learning how to hurt people like this? Like you should, I don't know. I didn't have a good mentor in martial arts. Um, I was just a crazy kid and I'm going to handle it differently with my son. I think I'm going to get him involved in jujitsu soon. I'm going to do like a father, like a parent or family class. Cause I think it'll be good for him to see there's nothing as humbling as jujitsu. Except maybe women getting rejected by women <laughs> or getting fired. Those are pretty humbling. But in a more less dramatic sense, jujitsu is very humbling because, you know, unlike the striking martial arts, like when you, you know, there's like a kumite, a, you know, you're having a uh, sparring with someone in stand up, you're never really going full power. So anytime you're like losing or getting, someone's getting the better hand of you, there's this, um, I noticed internally and amongst others, there's always like a, this thing you can fall back on this. You can tell yourself like, well, if I was, if I was really going hundred percent, I would have kicked his ass. If I was, I wasn't really going, I wasn't really trying my best. If I wasn't holding back, you'd be dead, man. Like s stupid stuff. It's like a thing in karate. When I did karate, it's like there was a kind of fantasy or delusion about it. Like if I was punching... If you punch full power, you'll blow a hole in someone, you know, like, like seriously, like delusional martial arts. It's a real thing. And it's like a little cult. Everyone's like telling each other like, yeah, we can all punch holes through cars. You know, we can kill people with our punches. It's like, no, you can't. Not even close. You can't even hurt someone with your punch actually. But jujitsu on the other hand is not like that at all. If you get defeated in jujitsu, you either go unconscious or you get your fucking joint dislocated or your arm broken. Like that's real. And there's no argument about it. Like you either are, you either submit to this other person's will that has overcome you or you are hurt. And there's something you can't like escape about that. That's good and healthy. I think because, um, you know, I got beaten initially when I was first starting it back in the day, Some, you know, smaller guys, like I significantly, I was way better at striking, but I didn't know a shit about jujitsu, and I would just get tapped out, tapped out again, 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 like more than 30 times in a night. You know, I don't, something felt like that. I don't know if that's true, but I felt like I was just tapping out. Initially, you, you only tap out, 
and your only goal is to survive. And uh, that's kind of awesome. And I want my son to actually, now that I'm more mature, a little less, you know, just, I think, I think it'll be good for him to see me losing and to see daddy like keeping his chin up and being a good sport and losing like it's no big deal. I'll kind of like model that for him. Because, you know, when kids are little, like, they don't like to lose. They, you know, can become little poor sports. And it's really important to learn how to lose gracefully and stuff, like psychologically, I think. And to be a good, like, just a part of, the, part, part of the community. And I see some of his same, like, competitiveness and fierceness that I had when I was a little boy. And so I want to kind of get ahead of it and help him with it. And I think instead of hitting martial arts or just, like, whacking the shit out of things and you're kind of hurting, potentially hurting people, I think jujitsu would be smarter. So I'm going to do that with him. Um, anyway, so yeah, martial arts. And I still follow it. I follow the UFC stuff. Not religiously, but pretty actively. Like pretty actively. I like it. I'm a fan. I like Dana White. love Joe Rogan. love Israel Adesanya. Stylebender. Like those guys are the shit. John Jones. Even though it's a shame. It's a shame watching his struggles. But but he's a, he's a brilliant, creative fighter. You know, this is just a ton of amazing fighters. That'd be something fun to talk about. Uh, I'm a big fan of South Park. Major guilty pleasure. Because South Park is basically like my childhood. Like being a naughty, kind of like a little boy with a naughty tendency. Like not, not naughty. I was a good little kid. But little boys like push the boundaries and they want to try stuff and get themselves into trouble. Practice, you know, they're talking big and cussing in front of their friends. And then they're all nice in front of their mommies and stuff. That's like, that was like me. Like just a little kid get himself into trouble like good times with weapons was an actual reality in my life me and my cousins all got crazy weapons and would go play in the wash and could have totally hurt each other and stuff. So. love south park conan the barbarian it's one of my guilty pleasures kind of like he-man this very over the top bombastic view of masculinity just kind of fun always always liked it it's fun it's a fantasy uh but I also like the kind of like semi-historical aspect of Conan, the Robert E. Howard stories, and the rejection of civilization or the civilized, civilizing instinct, the civilizing effect of society and of like social pressure by other people to conform to the norms. So part of Conan is rejecting that. that I think is fucking rad. Um, neon colors are a guilty pleasure. I like really bright colors. Well, you know, I grew up I was I grew up in the '90s. I was born in the '80s, and then really did a lot of my growing up in the '90s. And in the early '90s, I remember shopping at freaking Mervin's for uh, like Maui and Sons and like body glove clothing, and that was the jam. It was all really bright colors. Like there's pictures of me and my family at SeaWorld, and we're all wearing neon bright colors of different shades, except my dad, because I think he thought that was dumb. <laughs> but everyone else is like in. Fluorescent orange, fluorescent yellow, fluorescent green. And we all had like fanny packs and stuff. We were like a fucking pack of pack of fluorescent markers, you know, like embodied fluorescent markers walking around Disneyland. Um, guilty pleasures for music, a bunch like U2. Like a lot of people like, I don't know, it gets a lot of hate on the internet, Bono. But old school Bono with his crazy mullet singing, you know, at like Live Aid, like belting out like man i still like that guy i like i like you too i think they're cool i think it has probably gone on the sort of like the image has needed to adjust or something i, I don't know the the iter the iterations of the brand have not all been as successful as others but i used to love you too when i was younger i don't listen to him as much but it's a kind of a guilty pleasure, yeah. That's why it's a perfect guilty pleasure. Also, dashboard confessional. This is like embarrassing. This is like embarrassing. But yeah, I used to when I was like young in college, I was a real sensitive, like melodramatic, like you know, uh, yeah, just being super sensitive, like chasing girls that you know, like unrequited love, like just a dork, man, fucking dork, clueless dork, and listen to dashboard confessional being caught up in my sensitive feels and uh but every once in a while if i ever hear some of those songs like i know them i actually know them which is funny uh so that's a guilty pleasure i 
think I think I, again I wish I would have had a mentor to be like, dude, why you listen to that stuff? Like it's just gonna you're just reinforcing like hypersensitivity and uh, melodrama in your brain. It's not healthy for you. It's like you're just consuming a diet of of tears. It's just gonna reinforce that thinking of those outlooks on your life. So I don't partake in that stuff music like that anymore like music that just gets you feeling like just just to get feels i think it's actually it's almost like being addicted to drugs just like uh, but again it's a guilty pleasure um another one is the 70s version of the rankin bass hobbit movie like the old school the one where like bilbo baggins looks like he's got like a granny haircut and where when when you when you kill people they spin i don't know if any of you have ever seen that if you look it up, the Rankin Bass Hobbit film. The animation style is amazing. They're like Arthur Rackham illustrations brought to life. We're very near it. And uh, it's fucking cool, dude. I show up to my son. It's really good. And I have almost that whole movie memorized. I watched it so many times. Okay, another guilty pleasure would be asymmetrical character designs almost indefinitely or uh, you know without a doubt it's that's influenced by hellboy i don't know how many asymmetrical hell character designs i've done now that's a direct result of mike Mignola's influence another guilty pleasure is a hot bath and a book i don't do that as much as is either because i got responsibilities and shit to do <laughs> but when i was younger uh that was like one of my main it's one of my main like uh coping mechanisms like when the world gets too big you know, when things are too too stressful, grab a book, hop in the bath, and get away for a while. And that was how I read when I was in uh, junior high. That's how I read Lord of the Rings, like bath time, reading about ants in the forest, and you know, all that all that crazy stuff. Another guilty pleasure is uh, American flag apparel, America. I'm not actually particularly like um, I don't know. Like nationalistic or something, but but I am very proud to live in this country. We live in a good we live in a good place with a lot of opportunity and safety, and uh, it's a good place to live. I'm happy I was born here. I'm very thankful. If I guess you know it's a, it's a good place to be, and I'm proud. I am proud, actually proud to be an American, not in a country singing kind of way, in a legit as a citizen. I'm, I'm happy to live in this country. Um. Guilty pleasures, war clubs, like I mentioned, a man at arms club, like Native American war clubs. There's something about like ancient Paleolithic cultures, like Stone Age cultures, and uh, primitive peoples. And I mentioned Conan, that rejection of this of, of the civilization. And war clubs are a part of that. There's like something so brutal and ancient, like about that method, that weapon of war. That's always fascinated me. Like hammers, clubs, they're tools and weapons, and they're simple to make. And uh, I used to make them when I was a kid. I would like make war clubs, like out of leather and river stones, and it was like a thing that I did. And uh, I still will use, and a lot of my characters use those, those like as like a design element. And speaking of war clubs, I love uh, warriors riding on beasts. I mentioned warrior mans earlier. So I got warriors riding on beasts with with clubs. And that goes back to the Native Americans and like the Sioux and uh, mountain men in mountain scenes like Jeremiah Johnson riding on his horse in the mountains, that kind of a thing. Um, I love, I'm a sucker for dinosaurs and paleo, uh, like paleo art, Pleistocene mammals, like ancient mammals, paleo mammals, in knowledge about those you know those those animals those epochs just always kind of ever since i was a kid just been taking in it's never left i'm always absorbing little bits of information about that stuff i find it fascinating uh, lord of the rings lore i'm a guilty put like that's a major guilty pleasure like there was a period where i owned this like encyclopedia of the lord of the rings and i swear i was ingesting that like it was real like i knew so much obscure knowledge about tolkien that was almost entirely useless. And uh, 
read the Silmarillion multiple times and the Lay of Beleriand and the story of Baron Luthien I think is one of the most beautiful romance adventures I've ever read. It's so rad that he wrote that. Like it was kind of it was almost like a little romance adventure tribute honoring his wife, like his love for his wife. That's like the coolest thing ever, man. If you've never read the Silmarillion, you should. And you should read mostly, specifically, the Lay of Beleriand. I think the chapters of Baron and Luthien. It's one of the coolest adventures ever. There's fucking werewolves, vampires, magical heavenly hounds. You know, it's crazy. Another guilty pleasure are point and click adventure games, like the old Sierra adventure games, like Quest for Glory and King's Quest. Like even Leisure Suit Larry and Full Throttle. I don't know if any of those will ring a bell for you guys, but specifically Quest for Glory. That series by um, Lori and I can't remember their name. Lori Cole and I can't remember the guy's name. Corey. Yeah, Corey and Lori Cole. I think those games are so good. The point and click adventure games, I won't go into it too, too much, but those are some of my favorite types of games, and I'd love to make a game like that someday. You're just going through a fantasy environment, interacting with interesting people, and there's a lot of great dialogue and reading, storytelling, and problem solving, and combat. Uh, you know, a very um, simple, pro pretty simple progression system. So I love those. You know, and in more recent times, like, um, let's see, what's a good example of one? Like Sword and Sorcery, and then another one, Kentucky Route Zero. I love that stuff. The Muppets are a guilty pleasure. The Muppets are a huge guilty pleasure. Like the Muppets as designs, if, I, if you've ever seen any of my like, uh, kind of more childish designs or kid-friendly designs, they're basically Muppets. We're influenced by Muppets. The way the Muppets' mouths open is so funny to me. That simple hinge. And uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol is probably my favorite Christmas movie. I think it's like the best telling of the Christmas Carol that exists. And Kermit the Frog is Bob Cratchit. But it's actually really good. Another guilty pleasure and quite a, a U-turn or a, a right turn here are hammers. And I mentioned um, ball clubs like hammers. It's kind of the same thing. A brutal ancient tool and weapon. I love the shapes. I grew up with a bunch of them. My dad was like a really handy guy and we just had a bunch of cool hammers of all types all around. And I always just found them fascinating as tools. Like this one's for breaking rock. This one's for breaking nails. This is a bigger one for framing houses. And I uh, always loved that. So I always loved, always loved hammers. Loved in War, Warhammer, the game. Like the Sigmar, the big Warhammer wielding dudes. Always loved Robert Baratheon and, and Game of Thrones. And always loved those kind of things. Uh, guilty pleasure, biscuits and gravy. Always love good old-fashioned biscuits and gravy. The food. My mom's family is from Texas, and my my gammer, which is actually the old, like the hobbit, old English word for grandma. She was English. That's what hobbits call grandma's gammers. We called her gammer, and she loved biscuits and gravy and would make it. My mom would make it every once in a while for us, and I still get it every once in a while. Something really like comfort food. You know, it's a comfort food. It's very like down to earth. Something about it. Always love. Another guilty pleasure are different types of clay. Love learning about. Love experimenting with. Anytime I learn about like a new type of clay, I'm pretty tempted to buy it. And I often do. It's like instead of drugs, I, I sculpt. And I'm uh, always like trying new materials out and seeing how they interact with each other. And I get a lot of joy out of that. Another guilty pleasure are ribeye steaks. I haven't eaten one in a while, but. I love a good ribeye, a good fatty marbled ribeye. Holy shit. Rare to medium rare. There's a place in Playa del Rey where I lived called Moe's Tavern. Just straight up Moe's. Like, um, yeah, like Moe's in, in The Simpsons. Jeez. And they made an amazing steak. One of the best steaks I've ever had in my life. Like, for just at this, like, random bar. But the guy, the owner... I asked him once about it, and he was, I was kind of drunk, but he was like, he was kind of drunk too. And he's like, oh yeah, I only buy the best cuts from who knows where, but 
he really did. Like I'd had good steaks when I was at Riot. We'd go to good, you know, cool company dinners sometimes with our team for celebrations or when, you know, people would be in town. And uh, we went to some nice places. And none of those steaks were as good as the steaks at Moe's. You go get the big ribeye at Moe's in Playa del Rey, and you'll, you'll blow, it'll blow your mind. Try it. Okay, another guilty pleasure is the Joe Rogan podcast. Um, and Jordan Peterson. We'll just lump them together. But like those, that kind of, I love those like, those people I see as like free thinkers and people standing in the face of in resistance of like groupthink and what I see as uh, kind of detrimental thinking patterns in our society or trends in our society. I see those guys as like, you know, culture warriors. And I think that term sounds dumb, but there are people who are uh, fiercely, I don't know, resistant to resistant to peer pressure and groupthink and to poisonous ideas and I, I see them as people who are a good influence on our society like a genuine attempt genuinely attempting to be good good participants in society and good role models for young men and I, I, I like those guys I like what they do and I hope Jordan Peterson's okay with everything, oh, I don't know. I don't know what's really going on with him, but I, I, he's a good person. I think deep down he's a good person. I hope he's all right. Finally, guilt. Final guilty pleasure. So I just got to end this at some point. There is Edgar Rice Burroughs, the guy who wrote like John Carter and Princess of Mars, and you'll probably see a bit of a, a trend there, like Conan, He Man. John Carter is a similar kind of character, kind of like a heroic, like a heroic idea, ideal of being a man. And I always had a fascination with that stuff. I mentioned my dad was a firefighter and a real kind of quote unquote man's man. And, and uh, there's that John Carter's that kind of character just always does the right thing and it's always brave, you know, a heroic physique, great warrior, um, upright and true, you know, speaks the truth, stands up for others, all that good stuff that's actually you know, somewhat difficult to maintain on a consistent basis in life. And I cannot claim that I've always embodied those things. I have definitely not, but, uh, I admire it. It's an ideal, but I, a kind of, yeah, I'll say it's an ideal more than a fantasy. And I love just that world too of John Carter, like the fan besides just John Carter, that world of Barsoom, the, uh, that old view of sci-fi was early, early expressions of like, sci-fi space fantasy space opera i love that stuff like swashbuckling kind of uh flash gordon stuff where i get swords and laser guns and form green aliens and wild exotic beasts and beautiful women it's it's a cool it's a really cool world it's like a fun you can see when you if you ever if you never read those stories and you're a sci-fi fan you like star wars or destiny dune you should go back and read A Princess of Mars, and you will see, the you know, this is like the, this is the birth. This is the, the place where it all began. Um, anyways, that's probably a good place to stop. I probably got a lot of guilty pleasures. I'm sure you do too. They are kind of fun to talk about, though. Those are mine. Okay, the last question here we're going to do is another serious one. What were the high points and low points of your career? This is from Patrick in Germany. Um, this is one I've been meaning to get to for him. I went over it before and uh, wasn't necessarily, I think I did an okay job at answering the question, but I'd like to go through it again. Uh, it's a little, I don't know, now I, having had some time to think about it a little more. The high points, try to sum it up. The high points would be the small victories, like getting my first job at Turtle Rock. I remember standing in the kitchen with my parents with the acceptance letter we'd printed out, like all kind of standing around being like, holy shit, you could, you could have a job being an artist, you know, because my, my mom was a stay at home mother and my dad was a firefighter and art was just kind of like a crazy thing I was doing and they were just trying to support me, but didn't really have any, I don't know what they thought I was going to do. I didn't know what I was, I was just trying to get through life and got a job being a concept artist at Turtle Rock Studios and kind of salary and benefits and we were all like looking around at each other like smiling ear to ear like holy shit can you believe this like 
this is crazy. And we were all super happy. That was a high point. Um, and then getting my job at Riot was a high point too. Like I cried because I was uh, freelancing. I had a, a new little boy, gone through some intense changes in my life, some big perspective shifts and growing up, some real maturing and really a time of trial. And uh, it was a hard time for me, but a good time. Time was forcing me to grow up. But it was a, the gig, the offer from Riot was like, a, a chance for some rest, a chance for a little bit of peace for a while. And it was like coming, Riot was like offering me an opportunity to come in from the storm of life for a while. And I did. And that was great. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, you said career, so I'm not necessarily going to say life. We'll try to keep it about like the job. Those are... All, all the high points and low points have to do with both getting the gig and losing the gig or leaving the gig. And uh, at Turtle Rock, I was let go. I went through a time of, where I was really a mess, gone through some personal struggle and kind of made some mistakes and fucked up and got let go. And it was obviously, you know, if you've ever been let go, it's, it's pretty embarrassing. It's felt, you know, you're very ashamed. It's kind of shameful. Uh, you have to really look at yourself, like what you did wrong. It's kind of, it's very embarrassing. Um, but it can also be very good for you. It's good for me, ultimately. It does, you know, kind of leaves a kind of eternal sting of rejection. It's like you've been rejected by your family. It's intense. But again, it can be good for you because you have to, if, if approached the right way, it can be an opportunity to really learn and self-reflect. And uh, I like to think that that's what I've tried to do. And, uh, and same thing with, with leaving Riot. It was kind of bittersweet. Was, there'd been a big change in my team, like immediate team culture and leadership and stuff that I wasn't satisfied with. And uh, I just wasn't happy there anymore. And I needed to go. I loved the, my, my, my first family at Riot, but I wasn't a fan of how it had changed. And I knew it was time for me to go do something different. And that was both very painful, a kind of, like, kind of, just sad. It's sad to lose, and you feel like you lose people. Um, and and when you make a change like that, it's sort of there's potential that you like hurt people's feelings, or you make them feel like they've been rejected, like you're choosing to do something different than they're doing, like what's not good enough. Uh, there's potential for it to be somewhat complex as far as your relationships, social dynamics, and that part is hard and painful and scary. It's scary to like leave your job and come into um, conflict with authority, you know, and to try to stand your ground and be who you are and not compromise and, but still ultimately be at the mercy of it. It's a, it's a scary thing, but I got through it. Okay. And it worked out. All right. It all, it all worked out all right with riot. It wasn't, it was a good time for me to go. I was really, I'm really, it was, it was both a stressful time and one of the, happiest moments of my life as far as the high point of my career. So it's both like getting the job at Triple Rock, getting the job at Riot, and then leaving Riot actually was a, was a, I felt wonderful and empowered and like I had my life back when I left the company because I wasn't, it wasn't the right fit for me anymore. I need, I need to do something different. And uh, it's not to say that Riot is not a good place to be. Riot is a good place to be. It's a, it just depends on personalities and how you match up with the culture and the projects and, you know, your team leadership. Like there's a lot of, a lot of variables that go into that kind of thing. And it was just time for me, 35, it's time for me to try to do something different. Uh, but my time at Riot was invaluable and good and I'm thankful for it. So yeah, those would be the, those are the high points and low points. Like it doesn't, I don't know. It's funny. I don't really the art itself is just the like backdrop. I don't think like, oh, when I did that one piece, I was so, I was so proud. I don't know. Maybe that's not fully, maybe that's not fully true. Like there were a couple, I guess there were, okay, let me back up. They're, they're not as great. They're on the scale of like wins in life or high points. They're not as high, but they're on there. I guess if there was like a spectrum, spectrometer, like a scale. 
the highest highs are getting the gigs, like those things that really define your like the way you're going to be spending your time, sense of freedom and opportunity. Beneath those are like the acts you're doing at those, you know, during those periods of your life. And at Turtle Rock, it was like, you know, working on character stuff, um, doing the silhouette things. Like there was like times where it was, I really felt like things were clicking and I was like actually innovating in a way and solving problems and doing something special. And that was a good feeling. Finishing up certain pieces of character art that I've been crunching on, like, you know, really pushing myself in the development of my skills and then feeling like I'd feeling like I'd gotten the job done was a big, um, made me feel good about myself. Not even that I did the job that well. It's just, I don't know. Sometimes it feels good to just fucking get something done. Uh, but I'd say really one thing I can, one period in recent times I can remember feeling quite good about was this like Monstober thing I did with my buddy Alec Brubaker, the Sumerian. He, he and I did like a month of sculpting in October inspired by Simon Lee where he just decided to like sculpt every day in October, all monsters, monster themed stuff. And that was super difficult. Like, like a, a true effort of the will. I, I had a full-time job at Riot. I was teaching on Saturday and I have a son that I watch a couple days a week. And I was also sculpting every single night. And I think we went something like 16 or 18 days straight without stopping before we burned out. And then we needed like a couple, we needed two days to recover. We finally took a weekend off, something like that. We went a long period of time and then we were truly spent because we had like, we were up till, I don't know, sometimes five in the morning and stuff. But I remember at the end of that month, we, in the end we did 24, I think we actually did 24 days when it came down to it meant that we had actually taken weekends off. We took like numerically, we took, I think eight days off total or something like that, which, which, you know came out to four weekends, which was still pretty damn good. Like five days a week making a sculpture. And uh, I felt really proud of us. I'd never done anything like that before in my life. I really was pushing myself up to my limits, seeing what I was capable of. I pushed up against them and paid the consequences, like burned out at a certain point. But it was good. It was, it was a fucking awesome. And it was a big part of why I chose to leave Riot, actually, because I was making videos you know, with Stan doing stuff with Proco and sculpting and just feeling way more engaged in my, in the use of my creativity, like way more like, I just like doing that way better. It was like, felt more meaningful and I was having more fun. And I was like, man, I feel like I got a taste of what my life could be like if I was in control of my creative efforts. And it was kind of addicting. I was like, you almost like can't go back. I've tasted the fruit of the gods. Well, you know, like seeing Stan's business and sculpting every day. It was like, this is it. This is what I want to do. Something like this. Something on this path. And so that was a definite high point. Starting our company, Tarpit Studios. We started, we like basically made it official one day before the country went into lockdown. It was like, we, we knew things were kind of like not that great, but it, we didn't know it was going to get that serious. And, uh, and my mind had really been focused on what I was doing. And then all of a sudden it was like, this shit is real. And we had literally just kind of committed to doing this thing. And, but that day before we went into lockdown it was a wonderful day. I remember doing a little toast with some, some of Connor McGregor's, uh, proper 12. There it is. Yeah. Proper 12 whiskey. I thought that'd be funny. I was like, this is whiskey for winners. <laughs> like, and, then, and then the country goes into lockdown. And we're all like, oh shit. That was bad. <laughs> that was a bad idea. Start a company during a, during a pandemic. But it was also a kind, of a, a kind of a high point. A high point and a low point. Super scary. But also kind of awesome because like we're in control of our fates in some ways. Yeah, I don't know. Just felt, felt more invested our efforts as a team probably many other things i'm forgetting but that's a good that's a good place to to leave it that's a good that was a good question patrick like the one i think i did a little bit of a better job this time all right guys 
that's it. I think we're going to call this one. This one actually got kind of long, but I'll go through and edit, see if I can get it down into a good spot. But thanks a lot for being along for the ride. Thanks to all the new subscribers. I really appreciate your, your support. Um, I'm in this thing. I'm in this thing. Like I'm committed to it, to, you know, building up this brand and I've got my new little company, my team of guys I really like and trust and enjoying doing this podcast, I'm enjoying the process and what I'm learning from it. And I feel very committed to it. It's just going to take time before I work out all the kinks and get to something truly good. And uh, I appreciate your support while I'm learning, while I'm ramping up and figuring all of it out. So thank you guys all so much. I wish you all the very best over the course of this next month. Thank God summer's here. Hope you enjoy your, you know, the beginning of this summer. Congratulations for having, you know, made made it through the first, you know, this this. Hopefully, hopefully we don't have to go into lockdown again. Congratulations to all of us for making it through, not losing our minds. Yeah, just thank you all from the bottom of my heart for those of you who have supported me on Patreon and are, you know, just subscribing and showing showing interest. It's really, it really does mean a lot to me. It's really cool to imagine, actually, that people are out there listening and sometimes, you know, these things are resonating. You guys are, I don't know. The world is a wonderful place. The internet is a powerful tool for connecting people and sharing ideas. And it's kind of neat to be participating in that. I'm a bit of a caveman when it comes to technology and I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm enjoying this part of it. This like uh, challenge to myself to put myself out there and to be myself as, uh, as authentically as I can. It's been cool. Thanks for being along for the ride. Love you guys. Take care. Uh, hope you enjoyed your Memorial Day. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.